The Corn School on realagriculture.com is brought to you by BASF and Pride Seeds. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to the Corn School. Today we are talking planting green. Now that is planting corn directly into a live cover crop before it is killed by herbicide or tillage. More and more growers are doing it thanks to advances in planter technology, herbicide options, and a greater awareness of cover crop benefits to soil health. But how do you make it work? And what's the impact on yield? To tackle these questions and much more, I'm joined today by Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs Soil Management Specialist, Jake Monroe. Hi, Jake. Hey, great to have you on the Corn School. Happy to be here. Now, there's a lot to consider when planting corn into a living cover crop. Um, everything from, you know, cover crop species to planter setup and termination and a host of other factors. Um, in 23, you work with five Ontario farmers who planted green and you, and you followed those fields through the year. Tell us about the project and uh, what, what you were hoping to learn. Yeah, so Bernard, I, I worked with, like you said, five different growers across four different counties. I, I really wanted to identify what are some of the common issues or challenges that come up with planting into a, a living cover crop. As you know, I've worked with uh, soybeans being planted into, into rye. You know, that system is, uh, you know, can work quite nicely, at a little bit lower risk. But for corn, you know, a lot of growers are pretty hesitant to get, in, to get into doing that, especially with a big cover crop, a multi-species mix. So I wanted to uh, kind of dig in and, and work with some growers who've been at it for a little bit, a, a number of years and, you know, see what are the common issues, but also the common elements of success. How are they making it work? Yeah. Now, as I say, well, let's look at some of that, you know, you know, from soil types to cover crop mixes, termination strategies, and of course the weather, you saw a lot of different things in your research. Um, let's take a close look at a couple of your trials and, and what you observed. Um, let's start with what you call field two um, uh, in Brant County, uh, a nice corn yield here, 209 bushels. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that really was a surprise if you'd seen this field at the beginning of the season, both for myself, uh, for the grower. Uh, this was a big cover crop. This was a uh, cover crop that was over 4,000 pounds per acre dry matter. It was a multi-species mix with cereal rye, with hairy vetch, and with some brassicas in there. And it was actually a grower who was who its first time doing this, of planting green into a, into a cover crop like this. So um, this, this field on a nice silt loam, loam soil uh, in Brant County, uh, it was... Uh, came through the winter very, very nicely. Uh, it had chicken manure applied the previous year, so lots of fertility there. So when it came to planting, uh, you know, planted in, in the nice conditions, uh, but that, that corn crop was really slow to get up uh, out of this really thick, dense cover crop mat. So a couple of observations of this site. Uh, you know, we, we lost, you know, 4,000 plants per acre or so just from some issues um, with that thick mulch. Uh, we also had, you know, some issues controlling some of those species um, within that cover crop mixture uh, with the burn down, especially because that burn down was done a day or so after uh, planting. And, you know, some of the material kind of tramped over, difficult to kind of penetrate that uh, that canopy and get good coverage of the herbicide. Mm -hmm. um, so this field, like you said, though, yielded 209 bushels, nice soil type. Uh, we got very favorable conditions. And after a very slow start, it, it really did take off in the latter part of the season and, and ended up putting up a nice yield. Hey, let's um, move over to what you call field four in Haldeman County. Um, you know, a lower yield here. Um, you know, I guess you ran into some nitrogen issues, right? Yeah, yeah. That among some other challenges. So this field, kind of a, a grower with intermediate experience uh, planting green for corn, um, a challenging soil, a silty clay in Haldeman County. And the the big highlight from this field, or uh, at the time really was a low light, was that the, the planting which was done yeah, around May 24th, um, uh, was in, into moist soil, but that quickly turned into dry soil. And then we got no rain for close to three weeks. Um, and in fact, actually the cover crop transpired and, and reduced soil moisture in the top few inches to the point where that those seeds did not germinate until we got a rain around June, June 10th. So uh, really kind of highlighted some of the challenges, concerns with uh, living cover crops on these 
kind of two day clays that, um, mm -hmm. that, you know, just really goes from being too wet to too dry very quickly. And the nitrogen side, the grower really wasn't sure about whether to apply a good chunk of nitrogen up front as they often do uh, with, uh, with the herbicide. So held off on that, only had 20 pounds with the planter and we saw some nitrogen deficiency because of that. And there was, there was delayed side dressing because of wet conditions. So all the kind of challenges that often, you know, uh, will come in, into play on clay soils, but in some cases exacerbated because of the cover crop uh, in the scenario. Yeah. One more field to look at here. Um, Brand County, um, you know, a strong stand, but you know, maybe some burn down challenges here. Yeah. So this was, uh, this was actually the best field of the bunch. Uh, this is the most experienced grower out of the five that I worked with. Uh, it was a nice cover crop stand in the sense that it was a good mixture between crimson clover, hairy vetch, a couple legumes along with volunteer wheat and the odd other species. Um, it was not overly thick, but a nice, decent stand of cover crop there that, and fairly uniform. Um, like you, you alluded to, Burn, uh, the one kind of obvious challenge was just some difficulty uh, terminating uh, the vetch in particular. Um, and so we can talk about that towards the end of the video, but uh, we, we did have some escapes. Uh, it's not uncommon with some of these multi-mixes uh, to have that occur. It's something to be aware of. Uh, but in general, the, the crop stand was excellent at this field, the uniformity. Uh, and, and this crop really was kind of off to the races pretty quickly and ended up po uh, posting a yield. Uh, we, we didn't have the exact yield for this field, but all the corn managed similarly for this particular grower averaged 216 oh. bushels in 2023. A nice number. Hey, um, let's look at some of the keys to success um, when planting green. Um, you know, overall, what did you see when it, when it came to, uh, you know, plant stands and uniformity? Yeah, so we did see uh, a range in terms of uh, plant stands, but on average, we had uh, about 86% of what was planted actually emerged. Uh, so a little little lower than uh, than you might expect in a kind of a non-plant green environment, a no cover crop environment. Um, that did vary quite a bit by soil type. Um, generally speaking, though, Bernard, what we saw was that the, the sites that had a uh, more modest stand of cover crop uh, you know, not too thick, but not not super thin either. Uh, and uh, they tended to have the best stands and the best uniformity. And also we did have one strip till site. It was spring stripped. It was a lighter textured soil. Um, it also had a modest cover crop that came through the winter. That actually had the best stand and the best uniformity by far. So, you know, combining strip tillage with some overwintering cover crops, that really can be a win-win on certain soil types. Yeah. No, hey, Typically, you know, when you get good emergence, plant stands, you know, we, we got a shot at some strong yields. Um, how about yields? How do those five trials stack up? Yeah, so yields ranged from 174 bushels per acre up to that, that farm average that I just mentioned of 216 bushels per acre. And just to put this in perspective, across the four counties that, uh, that we were working in, that was 28 bushels per acre above county averages. So Yielded quite well, surprised me as I, as I alluded to in, in a couple of instances, actually how well the, the corn crop came through given some challenging beginnings at a couple of those sites. Um, part of that was the weather and the, the kind of timely rains that we had throughout the season. Another part of that was management and the fact that quite a number of these growers uh, did have experience uh, in this system and they'd made modifications to their, to their uh, nitrogen management, their planter, et cetera, uh, to set themselves up for success. Hey, yeah, some, some 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 great stories there, Jake. Hey, let's wrap it up um, with a look at your, your your key learnings, and you know what growers need to consider. Um, let's start with uh, you know managing cover crop growth. Yeah, so I've mentioned this a couple times. What what we saw, and myself, the growers, um, you know, was really that we want to be shooting for a nice uniform stand of cover crop, but not necessarily a a stand that's going to be a, a jungle out there to, to deal with. And, you know, that's something that very experienced growers, uh, I think, can can handle. Um, but especially if you're newer into this sort of system, you really want to be targeting for that kind of modest cover crop stand. And you can do that by, you know, perhaps backing off your seeding rate slightly, um, perhaps delaying um, seeding just, just ever so slightly in the summer. Uh, you know, getting getting some fertilizer applied, some manure applied, that you know, getting that cover crop seeded by maybe mid August or first week or so of August, uh, that really was uh, kind of common denominator key for success, not having overly growthy cover crop. 
Now, you also note that, you know, there are some planter modifications that, you know, growers really need to consider. Yeah, there's there's a few that I identify that were kind of common across all growers. First one was, you know, some sort of aftermarket closing wheel, some sort of spike clo- closing wheel, poly spike closing wheel. There's lots of different options out there. You can read the uh, read the report to see all the different ones that were used. Uh, that just helps with keeping that seed slot closed across a range of soil types. That is, I think, a must in this system. Um, down pressure is another one that, that that varied across the different sites, but especially the growers that are more experienced, they've moved to hydraulic uh, downforce. Um, even in one case, you know, row by row hydraulic downforce. Um, that really just helps to get um, uh, more more even seeding depth and kind of deal with some of those higher residue conditions. Now, what about nitrogen, uh, Jake? You know, how does planting green in, in impact our strategy here? Yeah, so it, in my view, it didn't necessarily result in more total nitrogen being applied. Uh, across these sites, there was actually, in general, a nice mix between legumes and cereals. But what I did see is that these growers, on the whole, four out of five growers, had at least 45 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre up front. Uh, that was you know, either on the planter itself or uh, with a weed and feed. And so that is certainly one, I think, key to success, especially if you've got volunteer weed or cereal rye in that mixture, is making sure that there's enough nitrogen early to get that crop going quickly. Hey, final question, that is weed control. You know, what can we do to optimize our success, you know, in this situation with weed control when planting green? So a few considerations there, like I highlight in the article, there are a number of different escapes of some of the cover crop species from the the burn down. So if you are planting green, you're going to wait until uh, right up until likely, you know, mid-May or even later in May to uh, to terminate your cover crop. Uh, Be aware of what kind of herbicide you should you should be including in your in your burn down glyphosate alone is not going to be necessarily consistently effective with some of our legumes like crimson clover and hairy vetch so looking at uh, dicamba or 2,4-D to include in that tank mix um, and then uh, considering the fact that you're you're in some cases with a very thick cover crop you're going to have a possibly a hard time getting um, you know effective coverage both in that burn down and uh, in some cases of residual herbicides. So being aware of the forecast for residual herbicides, if we do get a good rainfall, uh, you know, in the days and and weeks following application, not too big of a concern, can wash it in. Uh, But if we end up going into quite a dry spell and you've got a very thick Mm -hmm. canopy cover from a cover crop, that can be a concern. Um, So certainly things to learn um, from across these fields in terms of making some tweaks to to herbicide management. Mm -hmm. Well, Jake, uh, hey, I encourage everyone uh, to check out your full article on field crop news. Um, Some great work there. Lots more. We're only scratching the surface. Um, Sir, thank you so much uh, for joining me on Corn School. We'll we'll see you down the road. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks to the farmer cooperators who took part in this.